everyone. Um, we are going to get started. Um, I think people are still going to be filtering in, but um, in the interest of time, so we can get you guys out of here on time, um, we're going to start. So welcome to CS50 Quiz Zero Review. Um, for those of you who haven't realized yet, you have a quiz on Wednesday. Woo! Um, if you haven't started studying yet or haven't realized that this exists yet, um, past quizzes and all information about your quiz are on cs50.net slash quizzes. There's some pretty good stuff on there. Um, past quizzes from the last like 10 years, um, as well as you know information about this quiz and topics that will be covered. So let's get started. So you guys might remember the first day of class, um, David had those lamps on. So essentially everything that goes on underneath the hood of a computer is done in binary. Binary means what it sounds like, zeros and ones. It has two um, values that can be represented. Um, and so, you know, just like in the first day of section when David turned on a light bulb to represent on um, or one, um, our computer uh, understands binary as zeros and ones, on or off. Basics of binary, um, we have every decimal place, or every place is represented in base two. So you have two to the zero, two to the one, two to the two, all the way up. Um, to calculate what your binary is to decimal, you just follow this like equation type thing. If you have a one in any of those places, um, you multiply it by whatever um, base it's in, add it up, and you get the decimal version. So this is how you count to five in binary. Um, just like what we were doing on the last slide, um, this is how you would represent one through five. Similarly, just like you, you can add and subtract in decimal or base 10 or really any base, um, you can add and subtract in binary. Um, exactly what you would expect when you add the two up. If it um, equals a one, uh, greater than one, you carry a one, make it a zero, and um, do the addition that way, just like you would expect with regular decimal or any other base. Cool. So like I said before, everything that goes on under the hood of our computer is done in <laughs> zeros and ones or binary. So how do we express, um, for example, letters or numbers or characters? Um, and the answer to that is ASCII. Um, ASCII is a mapping between characters that we would normally see in the English language, like A's, B's, C's, um, underscore, dashes, anything like that. Um, and it maps that to an ASCII value. ASCII value is just a number um, that can be understood by our computer. And just like you can do addition and subtraction with um, numbers, you can do them with ASCII values. Um, so in this example, what will this print out? So just A space B space C space D. Um, and notice that you can, where did my mouse go? Okay. Um, notice you can you know, define an int at 65. And when you print that out using percent C, it'll interpret that as a character and it will print out A. Similarly, you can declare it as a char. And when you print it out using percent C, it'll interpret that as percent C. And um, just like you can add a, um, a number, you can add characters or ASCII values in this case. So a, a little pointer um, for everybody, um, five as a string does not actually equal five. So how might we convert um, the string five to the integer five? Any ideas? Yeah. So if we have five as a uh, string, we can subtract zero, and that'll give us five. And similarly, if we have five as an integer, add that to the string zero, and that gives us the string five. Cool. Um, now recall back to lecture one, where we talked about algorithms. So how do we actually want a computer to do interesting things. 
um, you know, just adding and subtracting numbers, printing things out, not that exciting. Um, usually, you know, we want our computer to perform some kind of algorithm, something a little more complex than just simple arithmetic. Um, an algorithm, just a step-by-step -set, set of instructions for how to perform a certain task. Oops. Um, just like a recipe. Um, you might remember the first day of class where David had us um, count a room of people and how many people were in the room. Um, you might be used to counting one by one, one, two, three, four, in that case a linear time algorithm. But David introduced an algorithm for you to count the people in the room where you know, you, everyone stands up, you um, say your number to another person, add that number up, and one person sits down, and you repeat that. Um, that's one type of algorithm. Um, we can analyze how efficient an algorithm is um, based on like its runtime, but we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So all algorithms can also be represented or written in pseudocode. Pseudocode is just an English-like syntax um, used to represent a programming language. For example, if we wanted to ask a user to guess my favorite number, we might have pseudocode as such. Um, guess, get a user's guess. If the guess is correct, um, tell them they're correct. Else, tell them they're not correct. Um, and pseudocode is a way of easily representing like an idea um, or an algorithm. So now, um, we might want to actually write this in a language that the computer might understand. So um, we would, could write uh, our pseudocode and interpret that into source code. Um, so far in, you know, source code must adhere to like the cer a certain syntax of a programming language. And so far in CS50, we've been using mostly C. So this might be like source code for C. Um, later on the course, you might come into contact with other programming languages like PHP, or if you even take other classes, you might do Java, Python, or even OCaml. Um, but in our C program language, this is how we might write the source code for the pseudocode algorithm that I just described earlier. So how does your computer actually understand that? Um, like I said before, it only really understands zeros and ones. So how does it get from the source code to something that can be understood? Well, we have something called a compiler. Um, if you recall back in most of your P sets, you had some kind of um, you know, program written in a .c file, and then you would type make. So what is make doing? Make um, is because you, you can type make to compile your program because someone, whoever wrote your P set, probably David, um, created a make file. And that tells um, make to know to um, run your compiler called clang that will then compile your source code to object code, um, which is zeros and ones that your computer understands. Um, but a little later on, we will go more in depth about compilers. So recall P says zero, where, yes, you have a question? Yes, um, I think they actually should be online. Um, it is not. They are on cs50.net slash quizzes. Slash quizzes, <coughs> slash 2013, slash zero. If you just click through quizzes 2013, click zero, review section slides. Yeah. So if you guys want to pull it up and um, look at it on your own computer, that's fine too. Say that again? Yeah, because it's just a dummy variable. Um, so <coughs> PISA zero, you guys all, oh yes. No, structs are not on the exam. Um, sorry, her question was with structs on the exam, and it is not. Um, so P says zero, you guys might, or should have all implemented something using Scratch. Um, and we learned some basic uh, programming building blocks using Scratch. So let's take a, a look at some of these building blocks that make up a program. First is Boolean expressions. Boolean expressions are um, ones and zeros, or anything that has two possible values. In this case, you know, true or false, on or off, yes or no. Um, an example of a simple, very simple Boolean program, or program that uses a Boolean expression up here. So in order for Boolean expressions to be useful, we have Boolean operators. These are operators that can be used to compare um, certain uh, values. So we have and, or, not, equal to, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, less than or greater than. 
But these operators aren't very useful unless we can combine them into conditions. So you guys might remember from scratch and from your PSETs, we had conditions. They're essentially like forks in the logic of your program um, that execute depending on whether a condition is met. So you know, one of the conditions that we have used many times in this course is the if, else, if, and else conditions. Um, here's an example of how you might use that. Um, does anyone know kind of like the difference between just using if statements all the way down versus if, else, if, and else, like combined? Yeah. Exactly. So um, if I had if all the way down this way, um, even if it returns, or even if this condition returns true, it'll still continue testing the next two. Whereas with an else if and else statement, um, if the one returns true, the others are not tested. Any questions about that? Cool. So um, you might use an if, else if, and else statement if you know that like it can only be one of these cases. So we know like if x is greater than zero, it's definitely not going to be, uh, or if x is less than zero, it's definitely not going to be greater than zero. Next, another building block that we learned are loops. We have three types of loops, for loops, while loops, and do while loops. Um, and generally, you know, when you sit down to write something, you kind of have to decide which of the three you want to use. So how do we decide which one? We generally use a for loop if we know how many times we want to iterate through something or how many times we want to perform a task. We use while loops if we need some condition to be true to be um, to keep running, and we use do while if very similar to while, but we want our code to run at least one time. So do while um, every, whatever is in the do will always run at least one time, whereas with a while um, it may not run at all if the condition is not satisfied. Um, any questions with that? Cool. So structure of a for loop. Um, you guys have all seen this. You initialize it. Um, you have some kind of condition. So, for example, if you know, or we might initialize as for i equals zero, i is less than ten, and i plus plus. Very simple one that we've done. Um, for a while loop, similarly, you have to have some kind of initialization, some kind of condition, and some kind of update. So we could implement our for loop also as a while loop um, using this. And similarly with a do while loop, you might have some initialization, execute something, update it, and then check the condition. So now functions. Um, when we put everything together, we might want to write some kind of function. Um, common function that you might have seen already, main. Main is a function. It has a return type, int. It has a function name, main. And it has arguments, argc and argv. So main is just a function. Um, other functions you might have used, printf, printf is a function, get int, to upper, um, but these happen to have been implemented for us by some kind of library. If you guys remember, um, including the cs50.h library or the standard IO library. Yes, question. The question is if main is inherent in C, and yes, um, all functions have a main function. Um, it's kind of necessary for um, the computer to know like where to start running the code. No. Any other questions? Cool. Um, so just like you can use a function that's written for you, you can also write your own function. Um, this is a function that someone might have written to um, calculate the volume of a cube, for example. Um, there's a you know our return type here. In this case, int, our function name q, and our list of parameters. Um, and note that you have to write the data type of the parameter you want to use, um, or else the function doesn't know like what kind of parameter should I be accepting. So in this case, we want an integer as our um, input. So why might we want to use functions? Um, first of all. 
great for organization. They help break up your code into more organized chunks, um, make it easier to read. Um, simplification, this is uh, you know, good for design. When you're reading a piece of code and the main function is really, really long, you, it might be harder to reason about what's going on. So if you break it down into functions, it might be easier to read. Um, and reusability, if you have a chunk of code that's being called or run multiple times, instead of rewriting that code like 10 times in your main function, you might want to reuse it. And then every time you need to um, use that piece of code, call the function. Cool. So now if we remember back to Scratch, we also talked about a few concepts, um, one of which is threading. Um, threads are, you know, it's the concept of, you know, multiple sequences of code executing at the same time. So think back to day one where David had you guys count off um, the number of people in the room. Essentially what was going on is all of you guys were running separate threads um, and those threads were coming together to get some kind of answer. Similarly in Scratch, when you have multiple sprites, you might have, you know, a cat and a dog and they would be um, simultaneously running some kind of, running their own um, scripts. Um, that is an example of threading. And the other concept that was introduced in Scratch was um, events. And events are, you know, when multiple parts of your code communicate with each other. Um, in Scratch, this was when you use the broadcast um, control and the when I receive blocks. Um, and also in problem set four, we kind of saw a little bit of events as well. Um, you guys might have used the G event library, and there was the function wait for click, in which you were waiting for the user to click. And your click in this case would be the event, and wait for click is your event handler. Um, and also throughout running your um, P sets and working on your P sets, um, you might have come into contact with some of these commands. Um, this is what you, you know, typed into your terminal window or whatever window that you know, shows up on your gedit um, to essentially navigate your computer. So, um, you know, for example, ls lists the um, contents of a directory. Um, make directory creates a new folder. Um, cd change directory. rm remove deletes a file or some directory, and then remove directory is removes a directory. Um, yeah, sure. Um, I don't know how much of this, um, sorry, the question was if you would suggest, you know, putting this on the cheat sheet. Um, if it helped, if you have room, you can put it on. Um, it's also, you know, just generally good stuff to remember, because when you use it, you might want to um, just have it memorized. Uh, that'll make your life a lot easier. Um, does that answer your question? Um, so now, uh, we talked a little bit briefly about libraries, but the two main ones that we've been using so far in the course are standard I.O. and CS50. Um, what kinds of things are included in the standard I.O. library? Yeah, so far we've used, you know, printf. In CS50, we've used getInt and getString, and the data type string also happens to be declared in the CS50 um, library. We'll talk a little more in depth about how libraries work and how they interact with the rest of your code, but those are the two main ones that we have come in contact with so far in the course. Um, types, these are good to remember. Um, how many, um, how much each type is represented by, or how many bytes each type is, um, of space each type requires. Um, int four bytes, char one byte, float is four bytes, um, what is a double? Yeah, so a float, but double the size. What about a long? Okay. What? Are, what is a long? Yeah, D double an int. Long, long is double in it. And then a long, long is double that. Yeah, 
So a long and an int are the same. And then a long, long is double in it. Cool. And then what is the last type? Yeah, so we learned a little bit about pointers. Um, and regardless of what a pointer is pointing to, it could be a char star or an int star. Um, always four bytes um, for a pointer. Questions about that? Yes? So a long and an int are the same in the CS50 appliance. Yeah. And so then a long, long is double an int. 32 bit, yeah. Um, yes, if it doesn't explicitly say, you should assume it's 32 bit. It would say something like, assuming an architecture like this one. Yeah. Uh, for 64 bit, the only things that change are long and pointers. An unsigned in is also four bytes. But what is different about a signed in and an unsigned in? Right, one can represent negative values, but how does it do that? Yeah, it um, saves one bit to represent the, the sign. Be signed has one bit that represents the sign. And unsigned just is all positives. Um, double is twice the size of a float, yes. So the question is um, how does the pointer to a long, long, uh, how is that only four bytes when a long, long is eight bytes? So remember, what is a pointer, essentially, at the very base value? Yeah, so a, a pointer is all, just a memory location. So it doesn't matter um, how much space that pointer is you know, pointing to. It only needs four bytes to um, keep track of that memory location. Any other questions? Um, so the last thing I have is standard output. Um, these, if you should use them frequently enough that you can remember, but um, this is when we use printf, for example, um, and we have like these placeholders that are called format codes. So percent %c for char, percent %i for int. We can also use percent %d, um, it's the same thing, but generally in CS50 we try to use percent %i. Um, percent %f for float, percent LLD for long, long, and percent S for string. Um, and similarly, we, we've been using a few of these escape sequences, for example, backslash N for new line. Um, this is just for when you're formatting your code for printf. Yes? So the question is, what is percent D for? Percent D is for ints. Percent D and percent I are the same. So question is, what's the difference between backslash n and backslash r? Um, I think backslash r is So backslash r just implies like return to the beginning of the line without actually going to the middle. Uh, so if you, type, if you print a backslash r, you go back to the beginning of the line, and then if you print more stuff, you overwrite the stuff that's already on there. Whereas an n actually goes to the new line and goes to the line. Cool. Any other questions? All right. Um, I'm going to hand it off to Dan, who will continue.
Alrighty. So I'll be talking about a another wide range of issues or of uh, ideas from the class that are roughly, uh, roughly representative of week two and the start of week three. Uh, starting off with casting, which is just a way of treating a value of a certain type <coughs> as a value of a different type. So we can do this with chars to ints, floats to ints, long longs to double. Each of these things can all be, or all of these things can be used as ways of treating some numeric value, plus uh, minus char, as some other numeric value. So there's some issues with this, of course, um, which comes when you cast things like floats to ints. So this is a little weird. We have a float that is 1.31. We multiply it by 10,000 and then we print it as an int. What does this output? Uh, 10,000 times 1.31, so uh, 13,000. Is that the guess? Uh, so I'm multiplying it by 10,000 before I'm set casting it. You might have some weird digits, and that's, <laughs> well, so right, it's 13, or it's 1.3, times 10,000. So that's 13,000. And this extra 13, weird, 13,100, thank you, Rob. Um, <laughs> and this extra weirdness, this 9,9, nine, nine, is simply because this casting ended up rounding down where it shouldn't have. Yeah? The casting happens after So because I have this in parents, right, it does this multiplication before it does this casting. I think it would cast first, yeah, which would be 10,000. Anything else? Cool. So this is 13099. Why does this happen? Imprecision. Uh, floats aren't perfect. They can only represent numbers to a certain number of <coughs> sig significant figures. And so if we print out eight sig figs on this float, we get a kind of ugly looking number. And that's because 1.31 isn't, can't accurately be represented by simple powers of two in the machine. And so it ends up taking the closest guess, which ends up being a little low. Make sense? Okay. Now switches are a different way of doing conditional statements where all we care about is a single variable. So in this particular example, we're getting an integer from the user, we, and then we're looking at what that integer is. Presumably, it's a number between 1 and 4. That's what we're asking for. So you do a switch of, that, of the variable name. Then you set up cases of possible values it could be. So case one, say it's low, and then you break to get out of the uh, switch condition so you don't keep going. In the uh, next case, so case two and case three, if it's case two, it just drops down to the first line of code it sees, as with case three, until it sees a break. So the reason you get case one to only print low is because I have this break here. If I, say, ignored this break, if I threw this break away, it would print low, and then it would print middle, and then it would break. So breaks are an important part of switch conditions, and they should be there. Um, any cases that are not stated explicitly are handled by the default case in the uh, switch, and should be treated, or should be cast. Values that n can be, yes. It would print low, and then it would print middle, and then it would break. So everything under a case before a break falls under. So case one, print is underneath case one, as is this fo following print. Yeah? 
Well, so this number is just a particular value that this variable can take, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes, case two would print middle and then break. Um, I think any. What other data types can you switch over? Uh, you can switch over any data types, but it only kind of means anything over like chars and ints and stuff like that. Because if you're switching over a pointer that doesn't really make sense, switching over floats, if it even lets you do that, because of floating point encryption, you wouldn't really want to do that anyway. So pretty much just ints and chars. And yeah, it, it's when you have explicit values that you know a thing can be that a switch is actually useful. Good? Okay. Um, scope is the range that a declared variable extends. So in this uh, little chunk of code I have, it would be full of errors. And the reason is I have, I declare this int i within the scope of this for loop. And then I'm trying to reference that i outside of that for loop scope. So basically, you can think about scope as anything that you declare within inside a set of uh, curly braces is only, only exists within that, those curly braces. And if you try and use that variable outside of those curly braces, you'll get an error from the compiler. This doesn't work. Yes. OK. Strings. String is a char star. They're exactly the same. They are just pointers to characters. And any string that you have should end with backslash 0, which is just a C convention. It is called the null terminator. And null, capital capital N, capital U, capital L, capital L, is not the same as the null terminator. This is a pointer. This is a character. They are very distinct. Remember it. It will be on the quiz, probably. I haven't seen the quiz. <laughs> yeah? The null is in the pointer. Yes. What does that mean? What would null be? Um, so if, say, malloc is called when you don't have enough memory to get whatever size you're asking for. Mm -hmm. Malloc will return null. It's basically whenever a function is supposed to return a pointer, you need to check against null because null is a pretty good, it, it, it's sort of the garbage value. It, it's a zero as far as pointers go, right? Whenever you call a function that returns a pointer, you're going to want to check sh to be sure that that pointer isn't null. Because null is a very common, it's sort of a garbage return. So if something didn't go right, just return null instead. Yes, and that's this. Uh, spell it as this. It's, it's the null terminator. It's lowercase n-u-l-l -L if you're spelling it. Yeah. Uh, and I just went back and tested it. And if you try to put a floating point value into a switch, it'll yell at you saying, statement requires expression of Oh, there you go. But yeah, uh, what was the question again? So capital N, capital U, capital L, capital L is a actual C thing, right? It, it is the null pointer and will only be treated as such. If you're tr you won't ever try and spell the null character in C any other way than this. Um. Uh, so are you referring to like returning char max from get, uh, get char or whatever yeah, it is? Yeah, yeah so uh, the general term for all those things are sentinel values. So like returning in max from get in and char max from get char are just supposed to be like, all right, if these things are returned, you know something went wrong. Uh, for pointers, we just happen to have this sentinel value that everyone agrees upon that this is the thing you return when things go wrong. 
The Ochar mask is what we're using to represent something like no or yes. So if you couldn't just check null, you'd have to check char max because they're the return value from the function is a character, not a pointer. Yeah? Does the function have to be like a string length that you give the null character? No. And that's actually how string length knows to stop, okay. is because it goes through your array of characters until it sees a null character. And then it's like, all right, I'm done. Okay, so hello would be like five. Hello would be five. So arrays are continuous blocks of memory. They have index or instant access by saying the name of the array and then in curly braces whatever index you want to go to. They're indexed from zero through n minus the length or one minus the length of the array or the length of the array minus one rather. Sorry, um, and they're declared by the type of the thing that you're storing in the array, the name of the array, and then whatever the size is of that array. So this is a char array of length six that has these values. Good, yeah. Yeah. If you have what you're, what is going into the array already made, so you could uh, specify this instead as, say, char, whatever the name of your array is, empty brackets, <coughs> equals curly brace h, uh, comma, e, comma, l, comma, l, comma, o, comma, null character, and curly brace. That would also work as a declaration as this. Then you need to have the size already made. Yes. Alrighty. Command line arguments are a way of getting input from the user as arguments to main. <coughs> main takes two arguments, the number of arguments that is being passed along the command line and a string vector or a string array of all the arguments. And so if I say used, I called the function such as a dot out uh, one space two space three. Arg c would be four, and the arg v would be arg v zero would be a dot out. Arg v one would be one. Arg v two would be two. Arg v three would be three. In that particular case, yeah. What is the, last the last element in the array because the array is length arg c plus one of uh, arg v, the last element is the null pointer. It is arg c plus one. So it would be, R, so the, in the case that I just said, it would be arg v zero is a dot out, arg v one is one, arg v two is two, arg v three is three, arg v four, which is one larger than the number than arg c would be null, and that's the null pointer. Yes, and that's because string is a char star is a pointer, and so it has to be the same type. Yeah. Two questions. So one, um, what's the difference between the string that string all the way down one one to type in the user input, and two, um, is it stored in history? Uh, where is it stored? I don't know where it's stored. Uh, so actually, you know how like any function you call, its arguments are stored on the stack? So argc and argv are arguments to main, and they are on the stack, or really <coughs> just above what you think as the start of the stack. Uh, what was the other part of the question? Um, so what's the oh. oh, yeah. Yeah, it, it's just a different way of getting input from the user. This one's slightly more efficient, and it's handier for scripts because you can just pass arguments to your main function rather than 
having to wait for users if you say aren't using if you don't have any users. And yeah, get strings would be in the it would store the stuff in the user. Yeah. Yes, argv zero always includes the dot slash of the function call. Yes, each of the arguments are ended in a null character because they're, they are strings. So argv, argv, Yes, argv, argc is a null pointer. So the question is, if the command line, uh, if you had the command line dot slash a dot out one two, would the number of command line arguments be two or would it be three? I think, yeah. I, th I think it's, it doesn't really matter. I would probably say, like I tend to say, oh, you didn't pass any command line arguments when obviously you called the function. So I tend to vocally exclude the function from the command line arguments. Even but if it was on the test, yeah, and also if you say something like argc equals three, you're in safe standing. Yeah. So like within this, you can sort of lock in argv time within like the int set in the argv. Would that still return the same value, or would it be a string for argv? I think if you called, yeah, so if instead of calling this in argc and string argv brackets, but I kept, but you kept the same types yeah. and just ca called them something different like A and B, yeah. would it still work? And it would still work. You would just, instead of using argc, you'd use A okay. and B. Yeah. Get string is going to So the question is, Get string is going to store memory in the heap because get string is char star. Yeah. It, uh, it's it stores memory in the heap because it calls malloc okay. within the actual implementation of get string. Okay, moving on. Security. So, to be truly secure, you rely on no one. You allow and you allow no one access to any of your information, <coughs> which is why everyone builds their own machines, their own operating systems all their programs from scratch, and obviously don't connect to any other machines via the internet. So, machi computers are insecure. They really are. Um, we have to trust other people, and the idea of security is that you're trying to limit the amount of trust that you need, and one of the means you do that is through cryptography. Cryptography is essentially, we have secrets, we don't Sometimes we have to pass our secrets along through, say, the internet or other things, and we don't want people to know these secrets. So we encrypt our secrets into a way that we hope uh, no one can figure out. And so we used, through the course of this class, things like the Caesar ci cipher and Visionaire, which are both very, very insecure ways of encrypting things. They're easy to figure out what they are or what your secrets are. Um, the real world uses much more complicated encryption schemes. And we won't get into much more than that. Cool. Um, debugging. GDB is the best. Um, <coughs> going to stress this again, use GDB all the time, every time you have a problem. Um, commands that are useful in GDB are break, which you pass either a line number, a function name, essentially where in, the, y in your code you want to stop and be able to take control. Uh, print, which prints whatever, or print takes a variable and prints out whatever that variable is at that point in your execution. Next, uh, moves your execution along one step and step steps inside a function in, s in your execution. Other things are like run, which is how you actually run your code. 
um, continue takes all the steps needed to get to the re needs uh, the next breakpoint, and there are many many others. Look them up; they're great. Yes, which is a debugger. So a debugger is a program that yeah. lets you lets you debug your program. Yeah. yeah, it's it's not a program that finds bugs for you. Though that would be great. Okay, um, and last for me is search. So the <coughs> types of search that we talked about in this class are linear search, which is just that you look through each element of the search space one element at, at a time until you find what you're looking for, or until you reach the end of your search space, th at which point you say that you couldn't find the element that you were looking for. And this takes, at best, constant time, which is O of 1, and at worst, linear time, which is O of n. Binary search, which needs sorted elements, you go to the middle of your element, see if the element you're looking for is larger or smaller than the element that you're at the middle. If it is, if it's larger, you say that the bottom of your search space is your current location, the middle, and you s restart the process. If it's smaller, you look to the, or you say that the, yeah, what's up? Yes. Uh, any sort of sort that's been taught in the class is fair game for the test. Mert sort. <laughs> <laughs> and the fact that you haven't had to do it for a problem set, it's fair game for the test. <laughs> it will be gone over. If you look at the practice, if you look at the practice problem in the merge sort page of study.cs50.net, there is the code for implementing merge sort, so you don't have to implement it yourself tonight. Um, but make sure you understand it rather than just memorizing it. Um, the the merge sort page on study.cs50.net, there is a practice problem that if you click through the problem at the very end. Um, there is a solution, which is the, the merge sort implementation. But make sure you understand it rather than just memorizing it or copying it down. And like a perfectly valid problem for the exam would be something like, here's a list. What does this list look like after one step of selection sort or insertion sort or whatever? One full iteration over the list. So even if you don't end up needing to code for it, you need to understand it enough to know how it's going to be modifying this array. Okay, dope. And that's it for me. Hey everyone, my name is Lucas. I'm going to talk about recursion, all the all the sorts that we have that we have learned, and um, and a little bit about pointers. Okay, so first of all, recursion. What does it mean to say that a function is recursive? Okay, it calls itself. Yeah. So like this picture, for example, it's like the picture inside of the picture, and so on. So, for example, you can have uh, as as Dan was talking about uh, binary search. Uh, one way in which binary search is recursive is the fact that um, you tr you're trying to find a number, so you go to the middle and then you check if the number is there in the left or in the right. And then if you find out that the number is going to be on the left, it's the same thing as doing the search again, but just on the left of the list. So that's how like you s like it, it, it sounds like it's recursive. Uh, so that's why you guys have a recursive solution for merge sort. Um, okay. So here's an example. So let's say that I want to sum all the numbers from 1 to n. 
I can realize that the sum of the n numbers is n plus m, n minus one up to one. But then if I, if I look at n minus one plus n minus two plus one, that's the same thing as summing numbers up to n minus one. So I can say the sum of n equals sum equals n plus the sum of n minus one. Does that make sense? Um, and I also would have something as called the base case, which is that the sum of the numbers up to uh, zero would be zero. So uh, as long as soon as I get to the number zero, I stop counting. Does that make sense? Uh, so here's an example of how we can implement that. So I have this function int sum that takes an integer n. So um, here I first check if n is less or equals to zero. So if it's less or equals to zero, I return zero, which is our base case. Uh, otherwise, I can just return n plus the sum of the numbers from n minus one, from one to n minus one. Make sense? Okay. So here's what it looks like. You have sum of two equals two plus the sum of one, and sum of one is one plus the sum of zero, which is zero. Make sense? Uh, so if we look at the, uh, at the stack of your program, this is what it looks like. Uh, first you have the main function, and then the main function called sum two. And then sum two is calling, is going to say, to say, oh, sum two equals two plus the sum of one. So I add sum of one to the, to the stack. And then sum of one is going to call sum of zero, which is also going to be added to the stack. And then each of these have to, re each of these ones that are on top of another have to return before the other ones can run, can keep going. So for example, here, sum of zero first is going to return zero, and then to sum of one, then sum of one is going to return one to sum of two, and finally sum of two of go is going to return three to main. Does that make sense? It's really important to, have, to understand like how the stack is working and like try to see if it makes sense. Okay, so sorting. So, so, uh, so why is sorting important, first of all? Why should we care? Anyone? An example? Yeah? Yeah, okay. So we can search more efficiently. That's a, that's a good uh, way. Uh, so, for example, we have a lot of a lot of things actually, like in our lives, that are sorted. For example, dictionaries. Uh, it's uh, it's very important to have like all the words in some kind of order that we can uh, access uh, easily. So that's uh, what he was saying. You can search more efficiently. Um, think of how hard it would be to have a dictionary in which the words are in random order. You'll have to look at pretty much every single word until you find the word that you're looking for. Uh, if you're using Facebook also, when you're looking at your friends, you're going to see that Facebook puts your closer friends on top of like the, the ones that you don't talk to that much. You're gonna see if you go all the way to the bottom of your, of your friend list, you're gonna see people that you probably don't even remember that you're friends with. And that's because Facebook does like kind of sorts your friends based on how close you are to them. Um, so organizing data, also Pokemon, so like they, you see that like all Pokemons have numbers and that's a, uh, an easy way of um, accessing, <laughs> accessing data. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> okay, so selection sort. So selection sort is going to select the smallest uh, unsorted value of, uh, of a list each time, each, in each iteration. It's kind of like the sort that you do in your head when you're trying to sort a list on hand. Basically what you do is uh, you look for the smallest number you put in like in the sorted list, and then you look for the next smallest number, and then you keep doing that, um, and so on. So, uh, so selection sort is basically you select every time the smallest unsorted value, put in the front of the, uh, put at the the end of the sorted part of the list, and keep doing that. So let's quickly see what this looks like. Um, so here's the sorted and unsorted list. Um, so for the sorted list is initially empty, and then I'm going to select the smallest number here, which is two. So I get the number two, and I put it in the front of the list. And then I look for the next, uh, the next smallest no element, which is three, so I put it at the end of the sorted list. And then I keep doing that. I find four, put it at the end. Find five, put it at the end. And look at how all of this, those times that I'm saying put at the end is basically swapping two values, okay? Um, and then the last one, you just, you just have one more element, so it's already sorted. Okay, so insertion sort. Insertion sort, you're going to have uh, also that thing of having a sorted and an unsorted list. The only thing is that 
the unsorted list is going to, it's, uh, no, sorry, that every time that you're adding an element to the sorted list, you just pick the element that is in front of the unsorted list, and then you're gonna find what position it should be in the sorted part of the list. Let's see what this is, so this makes more sense. So initially, for example, I'm trying to insert the number three in the sorted part of the list. So the list doesn't have anything, so I can just put the number three. Now I want to add the number five to the sorted part of the list. So I look at the number five, I notice that it's greater than three, so I know that it has to be after three. So I put three and five. Then I want to insert the number two. I notice that the number two is actually less than both three and five, so I actually have to put it all the way in the beginning of the list. So I have to kind of shift all the elements in the sorted list so I can make room for the number two. Uh, then I see the number six, I see that it uh, should be after five, so I put it there. And finally, I look at the number four, and I notice it should be between three and five, and then I put it there and shift all the other elements. Make sense? Um, bubble sort. So bubble sort is um, uh, basically what you're going to do with, we call it bubble sort because um, you go through the list, it's actually better if I just show you like this. Uh, you go through the list and you're going to compare adjacent numbers and you're going to swap their positions if, the, if they're not in the right order. So basically what is going to happen is, uh, here for example you have eight and six, you know that the sorted order would actually be six and eight, right? So you're going to swap the orders. Um, then I see eight and four here and I do the same thing, I swap again. And finally two and eight, I also swap them. Uh, it's called bubble sort because after each out of, out of of these iterations, actually the largest number in the list gets all the way to the end of the list. Does that make sense? Because it keeps swapping it and moving it to the right. Um, okay, so this is the, the second iteration will be the same thing. Uh, I'll do one swap and then the last one, I notice that there are no swaps and the list is sorted. So in bubble sort, we basically keep going through the list and swapping things and you I notice that I didn't do any swaps doing that iteration, which means that the list is already sorted. Make sense? Um, let's talk a little bit about running time. So do you guys remember what big all uh, omega and theta are? Yeah, okay. You only okay, what is, what is big O, first of all? Yeah, it's called the worst case runtime, which just means that um, it's how much you expect the, the program to, to take to run, like in terms of, in this case, n, like the number of elements in the list, in the worst case, like in the worst possible case. Um, so for bubble sort, for example, we have big O of n square. Why do we have that? Why, do, why is bubble sort uh, big O n square? Yeah, so you have to, so the worst case will be that I'll have to do n, n time, n, n iterations, so like each of the iterations is going to bring the largest element to the, to the end of the list. So the worst case is that I have to do that thing n times, and for each of these times I have to do n swaps, because I have to compare each two elements. So that's why it's n squared, because it's n times n. Um, then selection sort, uh, it's also n squared, because for each time, each iteration, I have to look at every single element in the list and then find the smallest, which means that I have to look through n elements and I have to do that n times because I have to select the, all the n elements. Um, An insertion sort is also n squared because uh, the worst case scenario will be, one, I have to insert n numbers, right? So I already know that I'm going to have n iterations, but for each of the, Though, but for each of those numbers, if I had to like look at all of the numbers in the sorted list and put it like all the way in the front, um, that will be n squared because it'll be n times n again. Make sense? Um, what about omega? It's the best case scenario. So it's like um, in a lot of times for sorting, uh, the best case scenario is when the list is already sorted, so you don't really have to do anything. Uh, bubble sort has the best case scenario of n. Do you guys know why? Yeah, it's just uh, if you keep track of whether the iteration had any swaps or not, 
uh, if you have like a, something like set to true, if there was an iteration. If the list is already sorted, basically what is going to happen is um, I'm going to try to swap all, like each two adjacent elements. I'm going to see that there are no swaps and I just return right away. So it means that I just had to go through the list one time. So it's n, because I look at n elements. Um, why selection sort n square? Yeah, even if the list is sorted, I still have to, um, for, every, for, for every number in the list, I have to, no, for every uh, iteration of selection sort, I have to select the minimum element. So it means that I have to look at all the elements in the unsorted list and find the minimum for each iteration. Does that make sense? Um, and insertion sort is n, um, because uh, in the case that I'm trying to insert the numbers and all of the numbers, when I try to insert them, I see that they are already in the right position. I don't have to like go check all the, no the other numbers in the unsorted list. So that's why it will be n. Make sense? Uh, and what is theta? What, sorry? Again? Exactly. So um, here you can see the only selection stored in merge sort have, have thetas. And just because uh, you only have theta if, uh, if both big O and omega are the same. Um, okay. <coughs> and finally, merge sort is n log n. And then, as uh, Dan was saying, uh, merge sort is kind of like the same way that you do binary search, right? So you get the list, um, and you're like gonna cut in halves, and um, and and then you cut them in like in smaller in smaller halves, and then you like merge them. You guys remember that, right? Okay, as he was saying. Okay, pointers. So what is a pointer? An address. Okay. Uh, I know that David like shows a bunch of videos of like Binky and like things like pointing each other, but I like to think of like pointers as like merely an, ad an address. So it's a variable that is going to store an address. So it's just uh, like this special variable that it's that is four bytes long. Remember that pointer for to anything is always five, four bytes long for a 32-bit machine. Um, so the case of the appliance. Um, and uh, it just has like the location of a variable inside of it. Okay, so uh, this is memory, basically. So each block of memory actually has kind of like a label, which is the, the address of the, the slot in memory. So that means that I can have a pointer pointing to like any of these addresses. So the, the, the reason why we we'll use pointers is if I have to remember the location that a specific variable is in memory. And you guys remember that one of those cases was if, I'm, if I have a function, if I ha actually want to do swap for reals, I actually have to send a pointer, not the variable. Do you guys remember that? The difference between uh, call, by, uh, call by value or call by, no, what's the name? What is the name? Calling by value and calling by reference, right? Okay, yeah. So call by value, when you, when you just send a variable to a function, <laughs> Uh, you're just sending a value, so you're actually sending a copy of the variable, and your program like couldn't care less about if it's like the same variable actually makes a copy. Um, and calling by reference means that I'm actually sending a copy of the pointer to that variable, so it means that I'm sending the location of that variable. So since I have the location of the variable when I call the function with pointers, I'm able to actually change the data that was in main. Make sense? Because it's not, uh, although the pointer is a copy, the pointer still has the real address of, um, of the variable that I want you to change. Make sense? So creating pointers, remember that um, pointers always have like the type that it's pointing to and then a star, and then you put the name. So remember that whenever you have whatever star, it's like a pointer to that whatever uh, uh, variable type that you had. So here in star, for example, it's a pointer to an integer. And then char star is a pointer to a char, and so forth. And, uh, yeah? So you said that where is the uh, int star at? Can you like give the pointer the max of the voltage instead at the uh, integer? Um, okay, so when you say int star x, 
you're not creating a pointer to a variable x. You're creating a pointer named x. Yeah. So when I say install x, I'm saying, hey, in memory, I'm going to get one of these this three boxes, and I'm going to say that that is going to be a uh, x, which is going to be a pointer. Uh, OK. Uh, and the reason, and something interesting about pointers is that, so we say that they are four bytes for a 32-bit machine. And the reason for that is because four bytes are 32 bits. And uh, machines that are 64 bits, they actually have uh, pointers addresses that have, uh, they're at 64 bits long. So it just means that the size of the addresses in the machine is different. Um, so referencing and dereferencing. There are two operators that you guys should remember. The first is ampersand, the second is star. Don't get confused by that star and this star, because um, remember that in this case, you have int star. It's like a whole thing together. There's no like int space star. So it means that it's the type. Remember that like when, the, when you have like the variable star, you're talking about the type. When you have uh, just a star and then the name of the variable, it means that you're dereferencing the pointer, which means that you're looking at the pointer, finding the address it's pointing to, going to that address, and looking at the whatever you have there. So I tell my students that when you have star, you sh should think that this is the abbreviation of content of. So if you have a pointer and you do star pointer, it's the content, content of the pointer. So you go to whatever it's pointing to and look at the content. And the ampersand is the same thing as address of. So if I have a variable a, like a, uh, let's say that I did int a equals 3, if I want to find the address of that variable a in memory, I can just do ampersand a. So it's address of a. Make sense? Um, so here's an example. Uh, so if I do, oops, and sorry, this is missing int b and int c. So int a equals 3 b means that I'm going to go to memory and I'm going to find a slot and put the number 3 here. And then int b equals 4. I'm going to do the same thing, go to memory and put a number uh, 4 in one of the boxes. And int c equals 5, find another box and put the number 5. So what is this line doing now? int star pa <laughs> equals ampersand a. So first of all, int star pa, what is it doing? Yeah, so int star pa first declares a pointer called pa, and then it's assigning the value of the pointer to be the address of a, so ampersand a. Um, then if I do star pb, what is star pb? Oh, sorry. This is also missing. Int star pb and int star pc. I'm so sorry. It's the same thing, but now I'm creating a pointer to, uh, to B and then a pointer to C. Yeah? Uh, yes. So PA, if you go to memory and you go to the box that is uh, designated for PA, you're actually going to see an address, an address of A. Okay? OK, uh, yeah? Yeah, pointer is an address. Never forget that. It's like the most important part about pointers, is that like they're storing an address to some variable. Anything else? Any other questions? Um, OK, so pointers and arrays, remember that when I do int array 3, basically what I'm doing is I'm kind of like declaring an, a, uh, a pointer to, so like array is kind of like a pointer to, uh, to a specific place in memory in which I allocated three slots for integers. Does that make sense? So when I do, so when I do int array three, what I'm doing basically is creating three slots in memory. So I just find three slots in memory. So if I do then a star array, it basically means the content of array, which means I go to the place so like I erase the pointer, I go to that place that, that is pointing to, and I put the number one. And then if I do star array plus one, that's the same thing as doing array brackets one, which just means I go to the place that it's pointing at, and then the plus one makes me shift one position. 
So I go to this position actually and put the number two. And then finally when I do array plus two, I go to a, where array is pointing at and then I move two memory blocks and then I put the number three here, yeah? Yeah, uh, so that's also the same reason uh, that, so like why do we, for example, say array zero, array one, array two, like one of the reasons is, uh, like I'm saying, like why do you do like zero, one, two, three, instead of like one, two, three? One of the reasons is one, computer uh, programmers prefer to start counting from zero. Two is because when you do array zero, it's the same thing as doing array plus zero, which means I go to that position and I don't skip any, any memory blocks. So I don't move any memory blocks. Yeah? Um, so basically, uh, one of the differences is that first, when you do, a, so she's asking what is the difference between doing this or doing malloc. One of the differences is that int array three is creating an array on the stack, and when I do malloc, it creates on the heap. Um, does that make sense? So how actually, how does malloc actually work? So, <clears throat> so why do we even need to use malloc? Basically, when your program is compiled, like you com your compiler kind of like figures out all the variables that you declared, and it creates a space for all of them in the, in the stack. So all of your variables are going to be somewhere in the stack. So here's like the environment variables. So basically, space for those variables in memory is allocated at compile time. So it means that your computer has to know all of those variables beforehand. It doesn't need to know what value you're gonna put in them, but it needs to know how much memory you need. But now let's say that, for example, you're creating an array or like taking a string, and you don't know exactly like, uh, like you're taking from the user, you don't know how long the string is going to be, for example. So you don't know exactly how many memory blocks you allocate, right? So it doesn't really make sense for you to say, oh, put 100 characters. And then what if the user writes 150? You're going to be screwed. So uh, you, should, you should do, uh, so basically you, don't, you cannot be sure of how much memory you need to allocate when you compile the program. You just know that on runtime. So that's why you have the heap. So the heap actually is going to have, you it's going to have memory that you're allocating during the, during the duration of the, the, the program running. So basically, uh, when you do malloc, what you're doing is allocating memory at runtime, which means that uh, you're deciding right at that moment that you should have that memory. Um, so that's when you're allocating it. Does that make sense? So remember, um, the stack has variables that are created on compile time, and then the heap has variables that are like created as you go with malloc, for example. So get string is going to call malloc. So actually, like this is malloc. Uh, let me talk about malloc and I'll explain get string. So malloc is kind of like a, it's the same thing as memory allocation. Uh, so it's going to allocate memory on the heap, um, and it's going to return a pointer to where that memory was allocated at. So when you do like um, int star, so here for example, uh, int star pointer and then pointer equals malloc size of inch times ten. I'm allocating, I'm creating a pointer, and then I'm assigning that pointer to the value of, um, to the value of the pointer that malloc is giving me. So I'm asking malloc, can you allocate space for 10 integers? That's what it's saying. And malloc gives me back a pointer to that place. Make sense? Okay. Um, and get string is basically doing a call to, to malloc so you can, uh, you can allocate memory during, uh, during runtime. Um, always remember to, to check for no because uh, malloc is going to return no if uh, it cannot allocate memory. Let's say that you ask for a ridiculous amount of memory, your computer is not going to be able to allocate that much, so malloc is just going to return no. So always remember to check if the pointer that malloc is that like you got from malloc is no or not, because if it is, you might be dereferencing a pointer and causing side faults. Um, and finally, don't forget to free <coughs> memory. Uh, so anytime, so if you, don't, if you don't free memory at the end of the program, no, sorry, malloc is like creating uh, memory in the heap, and you have to free that memory before the program ends.
Okay, that's all for me. <laughs> Sorry, Rob. <laughs> Thanks. Any last questions before Rob comes? No? Yeah? Um, I think David's uploading it soon. It'll be online. It's up? Okay. Yeah? Uh, yes. It should free all the memory that is put in the heap. Yes. Anytime that you have a culture malloc, you should have a culture free after you stop, you stop using that variable. So kind of malloc and free are always together. They're best friends. Yeah. Rob? Uh, I'll go quickly, and also the video will be put up, so. I have the mic on. Okay, so week five stuff. Uh, first thing we have is the stack. So uh, remember that there's going to be one stack frame per active function call. We'll see that in a second. And also remember what actually goes in each stack frame are going to be the uh, local variables of our functions, the arguments that are passed into our functions, along with a couple other things you don't really need to worry about. So here is an example program where notice main is printfing the return value of foo4. Foo is just going to return the value of bar 4, comma 6. And bar is going to set some local variable n equal to 4 times 6, and then return n. So let's look at the stack throughout the actual iteration of this program. So there's the bottom of our stack. Remember that the stack grows up. So at the bottom of our stack, we have a stack frame for main. When the program starts, main is always going to be at the bottom of our stack. And what is inside of our stack frame for main so even though there are no local variables to main, like I said before, we have argc and argv taking up space inside of main, main stack frame. So main is now going to call the function foo. And that means foo is going to get its own stack frame. So now we're inside of the function foo. And what needs to go in foo's stack frame? Well, foo has an argument n. And n is equal to 4, since that's what main is passing as foo's argument. So now foo is going to call bar. What is bar going to have as inside of its stack frame. It has x equal to 4, y equal to 6. That's not all that we're going to have in the stack frame, because bar also has a local variable n, and n we're going to set equal to 24. So now, bar is going to return n. So bar is returning 24 to the stack frame foo. And because bar is now returning, that means we're popping the stack frame for bar off of the stack. So all the memory that bar had been using is now off the stack. Now foo is also going to return 24 to main. So now that foo is returning, uh, the memory that foo was using in its stack frame is also gone. And now main is going to call printf. So printf is just another function. When we call printf, it's going to be another stack frame for the printf function call. Uh, what are we passing printf? That's what's going to go in its stack frame. Uh, at the very least, we're passing that uh, percent %i backslash n and the argument 24. Uh, it might have more in its stack frame if printf happens to be using some local variables. We don't know. But all that goes in printf stack frame. It's going to execute the printf. Uh, then printf's done. It will return. Finally, main is done. Main will return. And then our program is done. Yeah. So there is a subtle difference between arguments and parameters. And really, in common speak, people tend to just mix them up all the time. Uh, but parameters are like the formal name of the thing. So like argc and argv are the parameters to main. Arguments are what you actually pass in as those parameters. So there when I call foo of 4, 4 is the argument I'm passing in. And the parameter n inside of foo takes on the value 4, since 4 was the argument. Uh, n is a local variable to bar. But foo's n is, uh, n is still local to foo, but it's in, it's a parameter to foo. It's not a local variable. Yeah. Uh, foo is just calling bar and returning whatever bar returns. Yeah, just to see multiple stack frames and yeah. Oh. 
Uh, why was foo called before printf? So I could have instead done something like int x equals foo of four and then printed x, uh, but instead I combined the function call into the printf argument. Uh, but notice that we can't actually execute the call to printf until we figure out what foo of four is. So we're going to evaluate this. And only once that's done are we going to come back and evaluate this. Yeah? They totally should be int. That was not caught over multiple passes. So it should be int bar and int foo, since both of those are returning integers. Void is only if they're not going to return actual values. Yeah? Uh, a line above the return. Uh, so inside of foo. If we had a printf right here. So if we had a printf right here, it would print once. Since we are calling foo once right here, then we'll hit the printf, then we'll call bar, and then foo will return, and that's it. We only ever encounter the printf once. Yeah? Yeah. So, uh, so in theory, isn't printf calling foo? So no, uh, just. The order that C is going to execute these things is uh, before we can call a function, all of the arguments to the function have to be completely evaluated. And so is this completely evaluated? Yes, it's just a string. It's just a value. Then we have to completely evaluate this. Once this is done, now all of its arguments are evaluated, and now we can make the call to printf. Yeah? You do not need a return semicolon if you have a void function. OK, uh, so now some heap stuff. So heap is how we're going to deal with dynamic memory management. And this directly contrasts with the stack, which we would call automatic memory management. So on the stack, you never really have to deal with how the local variables are being pushed and popped off all these stack frames and all that stuff. You don't have to worry about it. It's automatic. So the stack is, or the heap is manual. So, and the manualness comes from these functions malloc and free. And so here's another program. Uh, all we're doing is mallocing an, an integer, we're storing it in, in star x. Of course, we have to check to see if x is null. Uh, then we're going to just set what x is pointing to to 50, print the value inside of x, print the, well, print what x is pointing to, print x, and then free x. So how is this actually going to look if we look at our stack in heap? So we'll start again. Uh, bottom of our stack as before. Remember that the heap directly is against, opposes the stack. So we're going to have the top of our heap up there. So the bottom of our stack, we have our stack frame for main. It has the space for argc, argv, and we now have a local variable x, which is an int star. So we're going to iterate through this program. First thing we have is a call to malloc. So we're making a call to malloc. Malloc is a function. It's going to get a stack frame. What are we passing to malloc? That's going to go inside of the stack frame. We're passing size of in, which is four. And so that is inside of the, that is passed to malloc. Malloc now, what does malloc do? It grabs us some space on the heap. So we're going to go to the heap, and we're going to grab four bytes from the heap. So let's just give that an arbitrary address, ox123. Uh, that's just pretend that is an address that is on the heap. So what is actually inside of that region of memory at address ox123? Garbage. So we have not stored anything in it. So as far as we know, it could be anything. You shouldn't assume it's zero. It's most likely not zero. Uh, so now malloc returns. And what do we do when malloc returns? We set what it returns. We set x equal to what it is returning. And so what is it returning? It's returning ox123, since that is the address of the block of memory that it just allocated in the heap. So Return ox123. X is now going to be set equal to ox123, which pictorially we frequently draw as like x having an actual arrow pointing to that block. But x is just storing that address. So now we have to check if x is null. It's not null. We pretended that malloc succeeded. 
Uh, okay, so now star x equals 50. So star, remember, it means go to that address. So ox123, we're going to go to that address. So that brings us up there. What are we doing at that address? We're storing 50. And so after this line, that is what things are going to look like. So now it's no longer garbage up there. Now we know that 50 is in, the, in that particular address because we set it to that. OK, so now we're going to print f. So first, we're going to print star x. And so what is star x? Again, star x means go to the thing that x is pointing to. So x is storing ox123. Go to that. We get 50. So print f that. And that means it's going to print 50. And then that returns. And then we have the second printf. We're now percent %p. If you haven't seen it, that's just how you print a pointer. So we have percent %i, percent %f, all of those already. So percent %p, print a pointer. So x is a pointer. So if we're going to print x itself, we're printing what is actually inside x, which is 0x123. So the first printf is going to print 50. The second printf is going to print 0x123. Yeah. So percent, do you use percent %x to print a pointer? So you can, but percent %x is just generally for, like, if you have an integer, you have some integer, and you want to print it as a hexadecimal. Like, it's just, that's just how you do that, whereas percent %d would print it as decimal. That's where we get percent %d. i is just integer. Uh, percent %p is specifically for pointers. So x is a pointer. We want to use percent %p. But percent %x could work. Yeah, so when we, at least for this call, so I didn't include it in here, but these two arguments are necessarily inside of this stack frame, along with any local variables printf happens to be using. And then the next call to printf, now inside of printf stack frame is percent %p backslash n, and whatever the value of x is, which is 0x123. It'll print, in des it'll print something that looks like this. So it prints it in address form. It looks like an address. Yeah. Why is what? Why is this pointer four bytes? So it, there are a whole bunch of zeros in front of this. So it's really 0x0000000123. Zero 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 uh, on a 64-bit system, there would be a whole bunch of more zeros. So the first printf is going to print, yes, it's going to print what x is pointing to. Star x says what, or star says what is this thing pointing to? Grab it. So what is it pointing to? 50, grab it, that's what we're going to print. Whereas the next one, we're just printing x itself. What is inside of x? 0x123. OK. And then finally, we have the free. What are we passing to free? We're passing x. That time I actually displayed it in the stack frame. Uh, so we're passing the value ox123 to free. So now free knows, all right, I have to go up to the heap and free that memory. It's no longer using what is at address ox123. And so free is going to release that from the heap. Now our heap is empty again. Uh, we, have, we have no memory leaks. Now free will return. Notice that x is still 0x123, but that is not, now not valid memory. We, do no, we no longer should use that. We should no longer dereference x. Yeah. Uh, is return 0 redundant? Yes. Uh, it's, we just put that there because like, we have a return 1 for error. So it's like, yeah, let's include the return 0. Uh, so after free x, what happens if we try to dereference the pointer? It's possible that nothing goes wrong. It's possible that we'll still get 50. It's possible also that that memory is now being used for something else. Uh, so it's undefined behavior, and undefined means anything can happen. Yeah.
Uh, no. Uh, so if you assign x to something else, so if right here we said x equals malloc something else, malloc size of int, then that original block of memory is not freed, and we have officially lost it. That is a memory leak. There's, we've lost all references to that block of memory, so there's no way we can ever free it. OK. So then return 0, main's done. All right, so stack overflow. What's the idea here? So remember, heap is growing down, stack is growing up. So if this was the example from lecture, I think, uh, where main is just going to call this function foo, which is going to call itself recursively over and over again. So stack frames are going to work exactly the same. So we're going to start with main at the, as the bottom stack frame. Then main is going to call foo, which is going to get its stack, a stack frame. Then foo is going to call foo again, which is going to get another stack frame. And then again and again and again and again until eventually we run into the heap. So this is how we get a stack overflow. And at this point, you'd seg fault. Or you'd really seg fault before this point. But yeah. Uh, so core dump, you'll see like segmentation fault core, fault core dumped. A core dump is just like you get a core dump when you seg fault. And it's just a way, it's like a dump of all of the contents of your current memory so that you can try and identify why you got a, why you seg faulted. Yeah. So a segmentation fault means there's a stack overflow. Uh, so not necessarily. A segmentation fault means you're touching memory in a way you shouldn't be. So one way of that happening is when you stack overflow, we start touching memory that we shouldn't be or in a way that we shouldn't be. So inside of an infinite loop, like this is like a recursive infinite loop, and so we get another stack frame each time. But just inside of a regular infinite, like while one print, well, not, let's not even print f, while one do something, whatever, uh, we're not going to be getting another stack frame. We're just going to keep looping over this single instruction. The stack isn't growing. It's the fact that each recursive call is give, giving us a stack frame. That's why we uh, get a stack overflow. Uh, so if inside of the while loop there was a printf, you still would not seg fault. I just didn't want to confuse things. It would just, uh, it would loop. You'd get a single stack frame for the printf. Then printf would return. Then you'd loop again. You'd get a single stack frame for the printf. It would return. Single stack frame. And so you're, you're not getting this infinite piling of stack frames. Uh, yes. So this stack overflow happens because none of those none of these calls to foo are returning so if we returned then we would start losing stack frames and then we would not stack overflow and that's why you need a base case for your recursive functions yeah uh, roughly uh, is the potential size of the stack in the heap the same for all programs? Roughly. Uh, it, there's some randomization to how the, where the stack starts and where the heap starts. Uh, if you happen to have a whole lot of like global variables and things, you might take away from some space for your heap. Uh, on a 64-bit system, you virtually have infinite memory. Uh, there's just so much that, like between 32 bits and 64 bits, that is a significant difference, that you're going to get a whole lot more stack and heap space on a 64-bit system, because there's just more addresses that they can use. But on an individual system, it'll be roughly the same amount of stack and heap space. All right. So last thing is compilation. So you should know this process. Uh, there are four big steps. So first one should be easy to remember, preprocessing. It has the word pre in it, so, or the prefix pre, so it comes before everything else. Uh, this, the thing to remember is the hash. So hash defines and hash includes and all of those, those are all preprocessor directives. These are the things that the preprocessor takes care of. So what does the preprocessor do? It's a really dumb thing. All it's capable of are all of these copy and cut and paste operations. So hash includes standard io.h. What is that doing? It's grabbing the standard io.h file, and pasting it into the top wherever it says hash includes standard io.h. And any hash define that we've seen, what is that doing? 
It's copying the value that the hash define is defined as and pasting that wherever you're using the value. So the preprocessor just does really simple text-based operations. It does nothing smart. So everything else is more complicated. Uh, so now that preprocessing is done, we actually compile. So what does compiling mean? We're now going from C code to assembly code. Yeah? Yeah, uh, we caught that. Yeah. Uh, so compiling, uh, we're going from C to assembly. So this is an actual language change. Uh, compiling itself means going from like a higher level language to a lower level, lower level language. And so C is a high level language compared to assembly. Uh, what is assembly? It's, the, it's instructions that are pretty much made for your CPU. Uh, but your computer still does not uh, understand assembly. The next, it only understands ones and zeros. So the next step is assembling, which goes us, brings us from these instructions that your CPU understands and actually translates them to the ones and zeros. Uh, so C to assembly to binary, but I don't have an executable yet. So think of like the CS50 library. We have provided you with a binary for the CS50 library, which has get string and get int and all that, but the CS50 library in and of itself is not executable. It does not have a main function. It's just a bunch of binary that you can use. And so linking is how we uh, assemble, I shouldn't use the word assemble. <laughs> linking is how we bring together all of these different binary files into an actual executable, one that you can type dot slash a dot out. And so this is like the file that you wrote, whatever your program is, caesar.c, or well, but now it's been compiled down to binary, so caesar.o. And this is our CS50 libraries binary, and they're being combined into a single executable. Yeah. So if, so first include, remember that the hash include is actually a preprocessor step, but that's separate. If you're not using any functions that uh, are outside of your single file, then no, you don't need to link anything since everything is just, you have everything. Uh, that said, like printf is being linked in. If you ever use printf, that's something that needs to be linked in because you didn't write that. Uh, and in fact, printf is automatically linked in. You know how at the command line, you, uh, or when you type make, you see it have like dash l cs50, which says link in the cs50 library. Printf and stuff like that is gonna be linked in automatically. Okay, any other questions on anything? Linking, uh, it's, we have a whole bunch of different binary files. So CS50 library, this is the canonical example that we use, is CS50 library, we have compiled and given to you the binary for the CS50 library. You want to use get string in your program. So you, you go and use get string, but when I compile, when, without my binary code for get string, when you compile your code down, you can't actually run your program because get string is not yet completely defined. It's only when you link in my binary that contains get string that now, all right, I can actually execute get string, my file is complete, and I can run this. Yeah. So linking can convert the binary to actually executable, but even if you don't have other libraries, would it still be necessary for you to get the file to execute? So an executable is still in binary. Okay. Uh, it's just combining a whole bunch of binaries. No problem. Any other questions? Otherwise, we're all set. All right, thanks.